Okay, so let's get into um, Bill Brown, WB8ELK, standing over here. So Bill Brown, WB8ELK, has been flying balloons to the edge of space for the past 22 years, called balloon sats. These high balloon, high altitude experiments have carried a variety of digital communications experiments aloft. Over the years, a number of university and amateur radio balloon groups have popped up across the world and have been a great platform to introduce new amateur radio operators and aerospace students to a way to test satellite hardware in a near space environment. In 1989, Bill was the first to fly a packet digipeter to, get this, 100,000 feet, providing digipeter coverage over a 12 state region. Bill's current experimentation involves implementing RTTY, CW, Hellschreiber, and Domino EX digital modes on a microcontroller with integrated HF or VHF transmitter in preparation for a long duration unmanned balloon flight attempt to cross the Atlantic. Bill was managing editor of 73 Radio Today magazine, remember that? In the early 90s, he currently writes a column called Up in the Air for CQ VHF Magazine and is also co-publisher of Amateur Television Quarterly Magazine. He currently resides in the Huntsville, Alabama area. Let's give a warm round of applause to Bill. Thanks, Steve, and uh, good to see you all here. Uh, and I wanted to talk about uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, modes of amateur radio. Uh, carrying them up to the edge of space. So first I'm going to talk about the, uh, the student program we do at the University of Alabama Huntsville. Um, maybe many of you have seen the uh, recent CNN and uh, ABC coverage and internet coverage of two MIT students that sent a camera to the edge of space and used a cell phone to uh, recover it. Uh, what they neglected to say was that this has been going on for 22 years, so it's taken that long for the general public to uh, catch on to the imagination of what can be done for uh, a very little cost. Uh, what we do at uh, UIH Huntsville is uh, for their senior double E design project, we have uh, four teams usually, four balloons launches per semester. And at least one team member uh, usually gets their ham radio license. Um, the really neat thing about it is uh, these students, some of you know, these are double E students. Many of them have not been introduced to ham radio at all. And uh, they get fired up about it. Most of them think, well, ham radio, that's a bunch of old guys sitting around talking on the radio. We don't. But when you tell them, hey, you can get the digital tele telemetry from uh, spacecraft and sends things up on a simulated space mission almost you know, into a near vacuum of space. They get really excited by that. Hmm. And you can do it fairly cheaply. Uh, we are blessed in Huntsville to have a large balloon launch facility. If you look in the back, you see that large structure in the back? That is a 3,000 pound balloon payload. They actually, this is the National Space and Science Technology Center, <laughs> which is affiliated with UAH Huntsville. Uh, they design balloon payloads with solar telescopes and all kinds of stuff that weigh three or 4,000 pounds, and they send them up on balloons from uh, Texas and from New Mexico that take truckloads of helium to inflate in the balloon. It's like hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to lift one of these missions. The problem with them is uh, it's tough to get time on them. They're booked years in advance and incredible cost and support, but it's uh, called the National Balloon, uh, a National Scientific Balloon Facility. So we do that on a much smaller scale, but we achieve the same altitudes. Uh, some of our payloads have included amateur television, of course, APRS. We've been using APRS since uh, basically the, uh, that form Matt was created. And uh, even uh, Bob Reninga has been flying a number of balloons uh, from, uh, from his area as well. And uh, he showed you a few of his uh, tracking efforts through cornfields. I have a couple slides of that coming up. 
Uh, we've also done film cameras. We take amazing photographs from space with pocket cameras. The, the new Canon cameras uh, have been hacked where you can actually store a uh, little script onto the camera card, onto the memory card, and you can make that Canon camera do anything you want automatically. And that, in essence, was the, uh, that MIT story about the hack to the Canon camera. And we've been doing that for about two years. And you can set that camera up to take a picture every 30 seconds. If it gets uh, after a certain time, you can have it take a picture every second. Or, or intersperse it with movies, so uh, little movie clips. Um, it's really amazing, and you write it all in a little basic-like program that you store on the memory card. A couple of key presses uh, on the uh, camera to set it up, and away you go. So it solves having to interface all kinds of uh, electronic controls or trying to rewire the camera to get, make it automatic. Uh, we've also done uh, solar power. Um, it's a great environment to test a uh, space qualified, you know, test out a um, satellite solar panel because you're above 99% of the Earth's atmosphere. So there you simulate it very closely to the actual environment you're going to see in space. Um, and that's one of the projects that the uh, students do. And of course, we do simplex repeaters and tracking beacons and uh, one. We gave one task to, uh, the packages tend to sway around a little bit during the flight. Uh, how do you stabilize the camera? Well, they took an entire camcorder and two servo motors, and they had accelerometers on it, and they moved the whole camcorder around to compensate for the motion. It actually worked pretty well. In fact, that is the uh, servo-stabilized camcorder. And they used it, they controlled it with a basic X microcontroller which is basically uh, similar to a basic stamp, only a little bit more powerful, I think. This is some of our students for one of our class. And uh, one of the challenges they enjoy doing is building the actual structure. That one kind of looks like a UFO. <laughs> this is a typical uh, balloon flight train, have the balloon at the top. That's a, uh, it starts at about 10 feet in diameter on the ground, uh, on the ground and at altitude it's 33 feet in diameter. Uh, in a little bit, I'll show you a video of one popping at altitude. Uh, below it, we have a cut-down mechanism. There's a parachute. That's a spreader ring to keep the uh, parachute lines from twisting up and falling on the way up. And guess what, what high-tech device we use for that ring? Can anybody guess? We get it from Walmart. It is an uh, embroidery hoop. And then below that, we typically have uh, our experiments. That, that is a fin-stabilized TV camera system. They actually put a fin on it to keep it from uh, rotating around. Uh, we did one in uh, California to study a solar eclipse. And it was pretty neat. We had a solar sensor, two, uh, two light-sensitive uh, sensors, separated by a black plate. If you went one way or the other of the sun, it would control a fin on the back because you're flying up, right? and it would keep it pointed at the sun. And we said, this is a great way to watch an eclipse with, but can you see the flaw in our logic? <laughs> it's a solar eclipse. <laughs> Worked fine as long before it was eclipsed. We had a big pile of parts. We decided to pull off this experiment 24 hours before the eclipse because the weather forecast for LA was going to be overcast and raining. We said, oh man, we're gonna miss this. It only happens once every 20,000 years. So we just pooled all our parts together. Let's build a balloon payload to study it. So, you know, after 24 hours, our logic was a little flawed, but we at least got it off the ground. <laughs> now, some people go to great extremes to track payloads. Now, uh, that is a Yesu Azel rotor mounted on top of a van, and those are aero antennas for two meters and 440. But he had to make sure he didn't have them pointed up in the air when he went under the overpasses. I was gonna say that. And uh, he has had one or two uh, mishaps. <laughs> now, where do we typically land? Well, this is one possibility. And there's another. I actually had to, uh, it was lucky I got there when I did because the horses were just about ready to decide whether that was edible or not. <laughs> in fact, they had licked them a little bit. And the dreaded cornfield. 
Now, uh, one of our group has come up with the AVR. How many of you use the Atmel AVR? Okay. Uh, he came up with uh, his own version of an APRS uh, encoder, and it uses the Mega 8 at Atmel encoder, and it works rather well. And he also incorporated a little extra feature. Uh, now this hooks up to like uh, any two meter HT or a UHF, but uh, he also has it so it responds to uplink commands too. So it actually has a packet uh, decoder as well. So we use that for uh, sending up command to release things or cut down the balloon. All done with a text message on APRS. And that's all there is to the circuit. Um, and then he uses a switching voltage regulator. And it runs on three lithium double A's. Uh, uses a free uh, C compiler, it's called WinAVR. Um, got a little $29 programming dongle. And it was, uh, the code is actually inspired by Zach Klobs and, Zach Klobes and John Hansen, W2FS. And thank you, John. <laughs> and he had a, an excellent uh, C routine for the AX25 encoding. And uh, that's all there is to the tracking payload. You can see the, uh, the wherever. Uh, and the, uh, that's a GPS-18 Garmin. And that's a DJS-11T um, Alinko, which you can typically buy for under $100. Uh, it works really well, even in a cold environment. We've really abused these radios, and uh, there's one thing you have to remember, however. The uh, stock antenna on two meters is virtually a dummy load. It's about minus 10 dB, so the first thing we do is take the antenna off and, and wire in a vertical dipole. So other than that, it's a great, ra great little radio for, uh, for this kind of stuff, because we don't cry too much if we lose it. We came up with a uh, cutdown mechanism called the Buzz-O-Matic, and we called it that because we were dropping a Buzz Lightyear action figure up from a balloon, and we used this to do it. <laughs> you can see the servo re release. And then we've done a lot with wireless cutdowns. That is just simply a garage door opener and receiver circuit we got from uh, DigiKey, and uh, SparkFun has a similar system. So we get to we get students involved uh, designing these kind of things using uh, what's known as COTS or commercial off-the-shelf components. So uh, they get to learn how to, how to do different tasks with what they can find in, you know, on the internet or through a catalog. And uh, since I told you yesterday about uh, hitching rides on the ozone sounding balloon, uh, we get to send up, as long as it's under 12 ounces, I get to get a free ride with these fellows every week. So there is usually a launch with some form of ham radio transmitter going up from Huntsville at least twice a month. I hitch a ride with them when I've got a circuit I want to test and design and see how it flies. So uh, you can't beat a free ride. That's the actual ozone pump that goes in there and samples the ozone. It pumps the air through a potassium iodide cell and it measures the uh, current and ozone affects that current, so you can get a, uh, a measurement of the ozone. That's how they actually test the ozone layer uh, in the uh, stratosphere and the lower atmosphere. Uh, I've been flying these little uh, tracking transmitters uh, at uh, Doppler DF systems. That's a little Morse code uh, transmitter, and this is a little voice one. It actually sends a voice message. That's an ISD uh, voice chip. And they put out about uh, 50 milliwatts on two meters. And uh, then I went on designed my own circuit lately to do all kinds of uh, telemetry. I showed that talk yesterday. And here we are out in, uh, that's fortunately not a cornfield, that's a cotton field, so, and it's not very high cotton at that. And that's Jason, KG4WSV, he uh, works with us quite a bit, and that's his own version of an APRS balloon tracker. So it's really nice to have the, uh, APRS on the balloons along with GPS because uh, before that we had to rely on purely DF methods to find our payloads, which was a great fun, great challenge, and still something you need to know if you're going to be doing a flight like this because if uh, something's going to fail, it's going to fail under the rugged conditions of a balloon flight because it's 60 below zero in the stratosphere 
and uh, it's a near vacuum, so it's a rough environment. And to show you a recent flight that I did uh, last year for uh, the Kentucky space uh, folks, I want to show you what a student flight uh, looks like from start to finish. Uh, these students, uh, there's 16 selected from six different colleges uh, across Kentucky. They call themselves Kentucky Space. And we did a balloon flight for them to uh, simulate some of their components they're going to fly on their Kentucky Sat. So, uh, and we also put uh, amateur television on this. Uh, this is their package they came up with. This is one of the students from Moorhead State University. And uh, this is a, there's a MicroTrack 300, um, an SD card for storing uh, data, a GPS uh, receiver. Uh, they even had a little uh, 434 uh, transmitter using uh, one of those little saw resonators and, uh, and a few other sensors that they, uh, pressure sensors that they put on board. Plus they uh, had a bunch of uh, the Canon Hackers Development Kit, they call it CHDK, and uh, they had two of those on board and they got fantastic uh, photos from the edge of space. They had one pointing down and one at the horizon. And then we uh, put on board an FM ATV payload. And uh, we were able to launch this in the uh, hangar of the Fruit of the Loom hangar. This is where the Fruit of the Loom company has their corporate jet. So they were gracious enough to let us inflate inside of their facility there at Bowling Green, Kentucky. And then we're doing the final test. You'll see the corporate jet in the back. And there's the students getting lined up preparing to uh, launch, holding all our experiments. That's an APRS tracker. How many of you have heard of the Find Me Spot? Did anybody know what that is? It's a personal tracker that uh, sends GPS data up to the Global Star satellite network. Well, the, uh, that system only costs $150 plus about $100 a year subscription, and I use it as a backup transmitter. When you're down on the ground, if you're in a ravine or out in the wilderness or in a swamp, and you're beyond range of a digipeter or uh, any way of hearing it, uh, the Find Me Spot transmits to the Global Star Network and tells me where it is finally land. So I put it on every flight now as a backup recovery system, and it works great. The drawback is it's only 10 minute increments and it doesn't give you the altitude, but it's puts it right on a Google map on their website. Uh, we also incorporate what's known as Pearl Sats. Uh, Dr. Bob Twiggs, who is now at Moorhead State, um, came up with this concept of putting student experiments into ping pong balls, and we string them on a string and put a soda straw in the middle of them, and they put the students put uh, different experiments like, uh, you know, marshmallow peep candies or, you know, little bugs and see if they survive. And it's a great way of getting the kids really involved in, into uh, doing their own little spacecraft, one little ping pong ball at a time. Uh, I do the similar thing with those plastic Easter egg shells, and I call those uh, extronauts. <laughs> and we have a, a, a spaceport, uh, a kind of a, they call it in space camp for Indiana Space Camp, uh, which we do at the spaceport Indiana in Columbus, Indiana. Um, we hold a a group of students comes twice a year there, and we do all kinds of experiments, and we end it with a uh, amateur radio balloon launch. And there we go, about ready to lift off, and it's off in the air. We were really fortunate on this particular mission. Uh, the emergency management folk brought their giant RV, and the Kentucky National Guard brought their uh, command, uh, command uh, centers, and I tell you, on a July day where it's 100 degrees out and equivalent humidity, it was nice to be, have a ground station that was completely air conditioned inside. It was wonderful. Plus they had all those pneumatic mast antennas and uh, linked to high speed internet right there. It was great. And that is our plush inside air conditioned ground station. You notice there are several different HF and VHF radios plus our ATV system. So we had full command of the simplex repeater, the APRS downlink, and our amateur television. That is a live view from about 90,000 feet on 1200 megahertz FM ATV. 
and you can clearly see the edge of the world and the blackness of space. Plus, we had uh, a little conference area, a refrigerator, and a little kitchenette. There's our uh, chase crew and some of the student members. And that's what it looks like at 100,000 feet. That is a picture from a digital camera, a $100 digital camera. The first time I did this, I used a film camera because it was way before digital cameras. In uh, the early, the late 80s, I took the roll of film after I recovered the balloon. I took it to Walmart. And when I got, came back to get my film, the guy said, said are you an astronaut? <laughs> How'd you take these pictures? <laughs> and each of those little squares is one mile square down there. This was taken over Kansas, and that is 400 miles. And you can see it. it the, if the Earth is not round, it certainly is warped. <laughs> of course, we all knew that. <laughs> for, the, for those of you who are interested in uh, following along, uh, this is a guy that uh, goes up in the air. You might be curious why there are bunches of helium tanks and lots of balloon-filling hoses and lots of string. What could, be, what could he be up to? He uses toy balloons, the party balloons. And that is one of our professors. This guy was doing a demonstration and asked our balloon sack class to come out and help inflate all his balloons. And there we are inflating the balloons. Anybody guess what he's about to do? Yes, <laughs> it's a lawn chair. <laughs> that is my APRS beacon dangling from his uh, lawn chair. And those are uh, little bags of water that he uses as ballast. And uh, that will take him up in the air. And when he wants to come down, he cuts one of the balloons loose with a knife. No parachute. Isn't that amazing? You better sign him up. I, I figured the fruit of the loom, I'm going to hook him up to the fruit of the loom people. <laughs> Uh, no, but I'm trying to get him in, involved in ham radio. But uh, we had fun tracking him on APRS. He went up to about uh, 3,000 feet, stayed up for an hour, came down uh, over the uh, river, and can finally control his altitude enough that he was able to walk right on the Tennessee River. Except the river is so polluted he had to throw away his tennis shoes afterwards. <laughs> But he came across the freeway, and all the semi-trucks are beeping their horns. People are going crazy, and they didn't know what to make of it. And there he is coming down for a landing. <laughs> and then, of course, I'm always interested in, uh, in new techniques for balloon science. So this is the future of amateur radio ballooning. <laughs> that is me sitting in the chair. <laughs> But I'm tethered, unfortunately. Uh, but it was, he let us all go up about 100 feet, and it was way of a lot of fun. Go ahead and put that on full screen for a minute. I wanted to show you the uh, third flight we ever did. And it's very important because you're going to see Debbie Flieger over here about going to space. Computer system, which consists of a, a microprocessor and a sensor board. We have a, a pressure transducer for altitude, which uh, sticks on the outside here. We have an internal temperature sensor, and on this stick out here, we're sticking out the side, will be an outside temperature indicator. Uh, this is all mixed into the live camera video as two lines of uh, information displayed at the bottom of the screen showing the altitude and the temperature. Uh, this is a tiny uh, black and white camera with a uh, mirror that points down at the Earth below. 
what will happen is uh, we have a servo to periodically move the mirror out of the way of the camera and we'll actually be looking at the for the curvature of the earth and uh, at 100,000 feet it should look very similar to a space shuttle shot uh, you'll actually see the curve of the earth the blackness of outer space and possibly even stars special computer graphics uh, I actually had hair here, back then uh, for this launch underneath we have uh, a, an amateur television transmitter, which is just below channel 14, which we are legally allowed to transmit video on. Uh, we have a lithium cell battery pack underneath there, which uh, should power this whole instrument package for well in excess of seven hours, in case we have to spend that much time. This is not the way to launch a balloon. About a 20 knot wind. Now watch carefully on the right, go, Debbie Fliegor, our camera person here, almost gets wiped out right there. <laughs> we almost sent Debbie over here into space. Now this was done in 1989 from uh, central Illinois near Champaign, Urbana. That is the actual crash from the balloon payload's perspective. And there's live television from 13,000 feet. This is done with 1989 electronics. This is a video overlay chip from a VCR, a Motorola HC11, and a pressure transducer because we had no GPS back then. So you can see the internal temperature right next to the feet is uh, a little lower, I mean the outside temperature is 21 degrees and it's 41 degrees inside the payload. Battery voltage and mission elapsed time. We also had a servo motor to move the mirror up so we get a horizon view and then move it down to look below. This is up near the peak altitude, 110,000 feet. And you can clearly see the edge of space. Now this was received in Chicago at a distance of about 180 miles, I believe. <clears throat> One watt transmitter on 434 megahertz fast scan wideband video, AM video. That little camera you saw, that has a tube in it. This was before CCD sensors. And notice the temperature now at altitude, the outside temperature. It's got a minus sign in front of it. And in fact, that's one of the things you have to can design for. Notice it's 70 degrees inside. This is the balloon burst, by the way. Now, considering this is a one watt transmitter being received in downtown Chicago with all kinds of interference, that's why the picture is, and, and a pretty good distance for one watt, uh, it's got a little snow in it. Now, if that had been a digital ATV transmission, it would have been perfect. Now, we're coming in for a landing. Now the mirror is a little in the field of view because somehow, probably because of that bad takeoff. <laughs> you got, things got bent up a little bit. And we landed uh, near Indianapolis. We were about 20 miles northwest of downtown Indianapolis and landed in a, a soybean field. Now usually I have sensors on these packages where they land in trees or cornfields but somehow the sensor wasn't working, so it landed in a nice soybean field this time. But generally it goes for, if, there, if there's one tree in a 10 square mile area, it will land in that tree. And it's done that before. I found a tree in Eastern Colorado. <laughs> I like to call this X marks the spot. <laughs> you can actually see the light poles from the, uh, the shadow of the light poles just before it hits. Now, this is recorded uh, from an a ATV operator about eight miles away from where it landed. And we had a chase plane and uh, he was able to uh, zoom over the area and and actually witnessed the uh, thing perishing out of the sky right in front of him. And there he goes. Well, 
takes a looking and keeps on ticking. Uh, it got kind of beat. That happened on takeoff, by the way, that bent uh, big wheel. Quite a takeoff, as you'll see in the tape. This is what happened to the servo mirror when it hit, and the altitude, I mean, the temperature sensor got bashed. But it's still in one piece, still transmitting. We're starting in the beans. If we had been another hour late, it would have been munched through the combine. <laughs> Okay, I'll show you uh, one more video, um, the next one on the list. Um, I believe this is the Space Camp a video I did for uh, Huntsville, Alabama's uh, skate, original Space Camp. We did this in 1994 when I first moved to Huntsville. And we involved uh, the space campers as part of their activities was to launch a balloon with a camera into space. Well, some budget conscious ideas that would make NASA jealous here on NewsCenter 19 and 10. Why would the folks in the world space? No, we didn't send Jack Daniels into space. Out of this world without a rocket. Around the world are in Huntsville tonight attending International Space Camp at the Space and Rocket Center. And to help kick off their exciting week of science, New Center 19's Dick Curtis says they helped send a package to the edge of space. It's only appropriate to reach for the stars at a place like the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. But what if you don't have a rocket handy? Well, Huntsville engineer Bill Brown says, use a balloon. If you were to ride along with this balloon, you could see from Florida to Ohio. Bill's been sending up balloons for years, but not just any balloons. If all goes as planned, this balloon will zoom up well over 100,000 feet above the valley and send back full color video. Hold on to it. The when Space and Rocket Center, along with the local chapter of the National Space Society, backed the launch, which may become a regular part of Space Camp. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for a balloon. <laughs> The camera was working great, sending back video on a ham radio transmitter. And this would be no quick trip. It would take about two hours to get up to 120,000 feet, high enough to see the curvature of the Earth and the blackness of space. The balloon did everything Bill hoped it would. At 120,000 feet, it burst, and a parachute brought the camera and transmitter back to Earth. Hams on the ground tracked its descent and knew it landed north of Huntsville. As it turned out, the pictures coming from the balloon told where. Folks at the Lincoln County Courthouse looked at the video and knew. Right there. That's, it. That's the McGee's chicken houses. The McGee's Sure enough, Who needs after the yes. ham radio operators searched near his farm for about an hour, there it was, out in the middle of a cow pasture. Oh, you had a hard damn time getting through the world. You didn't have no friends. That, you, you said it. You said it. From near space to the back 40, all in one day. And this is Dick Curtis at Large, New Center 19, right. Lincoln County. Okay, uh, wait before we do this next video. I wanted to say that um, in lieu of GPS and APRS, all you need is the local tax assessor <laughs> and a good photograph. That just astounded me when she could identify the actual chicken houses. <laughs> um, those are smaller balloons, the latex weather balloons, and we can carry up 12 pounds legally with the FAA regulations. Um, but what can you do if you have no restrictions? We filed a waiver to launch a 400-pound rocket from a balloon. How many of you have heard of the X Prize? Okay. I was actually one of the competitors in the X Prize, but we didn't have $20 million backing us like uh, Bert Rutan did. Uh, but before that, there was something called the Cats Prize, Cheap Access to Space. It was $250,000 for the first group to send a rocket above 50 miles, which is the, well, actually 62 miles, 100 kilometers, which is the definition of space. And so we were going to send a rocket launched from a balloon. We call those raccoons. So I'll show you what, this is the rocket we used. This is, we did this several, we did this twice. Actually, we did it three times, but I won't tell you about the second time the rocket fell off the balloon onto the deck of the boat, hissing at us, pointing at us. <laughs> So where do you run and hide in that case? <laughs> uh, 
But we're using a hybrid rocket, so it's got a nitrous oxide tank, and we were using asphalt for the fuel grain. I like to call that paving the road to space and laughing all the way. <laughs> so we had on board uh, 1,200 megahertz ATV, uh, a APRS, and even a 900 megahertz uh, spread spectrum radio. The goal was to lift off from a deck of a boat over the Gulf of Mexico, go up to, in the stratosphere, launch the rocket past the balloon, hit space, and here's the flight profile. This is the balloon launch portion, this is the rocket launch portion. And once you got above 328,000 feet, how many of you saw the tail, know the tail number of Spaceship One? It's 328 KF. 328,000 feet. There's a little bit of trivia for you. So once you get about 328,000 feet, we would have won the $250,000 prize. That was our goal. The FAA would not let us do this over Alabama or even Florida for that matter. I'm, they wanted us to be at least 200 miles from any kind of land. I guess having a rocket sticking out of the top of Cinderella's castle just wasn't on their agenda. I th personally think it would be an improvement. So we had to keep it a little bit far from the coastline. So we hired this giant boat. Oh, I wanted to tell you, uh, first of all, I came up with, I asked my engineers, uh, propulsion engineers, to come up with a very portable, mobile, lightweight rocket test stand. That's what they came up with. <laughs> that is actually a 100-pound hybrid rocket on a bicycle. That's the rocket bike and it'll go from zero to 30 in about two seconds. <laughs> so uh, I'll show you the little more practical uh, range test stand they came up with and for the bigger motors. That's a 1,500 pound thrust motor on a portable trailer that we came up with. Uh, we did uh, balloon testing with various types of balloons. That's a latex balloon. That is called a zero-pressure balloon. It's a plastic envelope that goes up to altitude, has a vent in it, just a little slit in the bottom, and it dumps out excess helium. And then it will park all day at that altitude. And in fact, if you drop off ballast at night, because you'll lose a little solar lift each day, you can keep it flying for about five days. This is the kind of balloon I'm going to fly across the Atlantic. And that's what it looks like when it lifts off. That's a fairly small balloon. That only went up to about 28,000 feet. But we were flying a 25-pound payload. You had to get a waiver for, for that. But we flew that from Huntsville. That particular system, you see it's pretty massive, landed in Dallas, Georgia, behind a woman's backyard while she was washing dishes. And she sees this silver thing land in her kudzu. <laughs> She called the TV and radio stations and said, a UFO has landed in my backyard. And five minutes later, my chase team knocked on the door, many of which looked like aliens. <laughs> she thought, sure, she was being abducted by alien abduction. We finally talked her way into her backyard and recovered the payload. I don't think the TV and radio stations ever returned her calls, though. Uh, this is a ground test of our uh, rocket. And uh, no, that's not an Afghan rebel. That's, uh, that's the leader of our team. We called it Project Halo for high altitude liftoff. And this is our Sky Launch 1. We did this, for, this one we launched from the uh, coast of North Carolina. And the winds took us uh, 100 miles out to sea. And we were able to get good video on both 1200 FM and 434 AM ATV, as well as packets from 100 miles out. That's when we ignited the rocket. We actually ended up in the Guinness Book of Records for the highest amateur rocket uh, flight of 36 nautical miles, which we did. We didn't, meet, didn't make it to uh, our goal, but we did make it into that edition of Guinness. And uh, that's what it looked like when it took off. And that's our, uh, you may have seen the picture of the first satellite. <laughs> we tried to simulate that. 
Then we went on. This is the one that fell on the deck of the boat pointing at, it, at us hissing. We were uh, taking 100 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico on a NASA barge. This is the barge they use to uh, carry the solid rocket boosters and the big, and there's another barge similar to it that carries the uh, main rocket engine uh, tank from Michoud, Louisiana to Cape uh, Kennedy. And so they, uh, NASA carried us out there. They were trying to prove a uh, air corridor for launching rockets across the Gulf of Mexico. So they gave us a free ride. Um, I'll tell you though, when it's 100 degrees out and it's 100% humidity in the Gulf of Mexico, it gets awfully hot. Straw hats are the way to go. Uh, this barge was behind a tugboat. When the rocket fell off, the balloon had 200 pounds of lift on it, and I had a 10-pound ATV and a GPS package below it, and that took off like a rocket. And it landed about 11 miles away. Now, we're 100 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico. We said, well, that's lost. We'll never see that ATV payload again. The tugboat captain calls our barge and said, do you all want your payload back? I said, pardon me? It's 11 miles away. Well, it landed, to my, landed right next to our sister ship, and they've hauled it onto the deck of their boat. <laughs> I had no idea it was traffic problems out in the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> or 100 miles out to sea. So we got it back, but I got to tell you, what do you think salt water does to electronics? Not a pretty sight, all green and nasty. <laughs> that is a rocket glider. We called that the balloon launch return vehicle. We had a uh, 40-pound rocket engine, hybrid rocket in the center. That's the ATV camera on 2.4 gigahertz. And this is our ailerons. That is a lifting body. It's one of the early uh, shapes that they use for the space program for return vehicles. And uh, the idea is that it would right itself coming down from space and hitting the atmosphere. And we were going to launch that from this boat out in the middle of the Gulf. This is our radio control setup. Uh, we did this on 900 megahertz with a 900 megahertz uh, data radio system. And uh, it's a complete RC control unit. We were going to actually hand fly it back to us through radio control on 900 megahertz. And uh, we were, and up here is 2.4 gigahertz ATV coming down. That's the nose camera from 75,000 feet up coming down from the, uh, from the rocket glider. This is our uh, steerable dish antenna. And there it takes off. It actually looks like a space shuttle. We got it to 75,000 feet, but unfortunately, we weren't able to cut it down. We did fire the rocket engine, but it spun around like crazy, but we couldn't get it off the uh, launch hook. So um, we tried again with another, another mission. That's the 400-pound rocket. And uh, that is 14 feet long. That's all our tracking, ATV, and telemetry, and fire command control units. And we had a camera in the nose cone and a camera in the launch platform. I'll be showing you a view, a video from the uh, launch gondola. And off it goes. The advantage of launching something like this from a boat is you can cancel the wind out completely we put a pilot balloon, like a little blimp balloon, in the front of the captain's uh, wheelhouse. And he keeps that balloon vertical, and the big balloon we inflate in the back stays vertical, too. So we can launch this under any condition up to about the speed of the boat, which is about 14 knots. And uh, on land, you have to keep the winds down below 5 miles an hour. You can't fly a balloon like this. Now, uh, I've shown you some of these landing locations. Launching from a boat prevents this from happening. <laughs> now, I want to show you something a little interesting. How many of you have seen this APRS IS VHF propagation map? How many of you have tried that? Uh, what it is, it's, it's looking at the uh, digipeters, what digipeters are receiving, and can tell you where a tropospheric band opening or duct or even meteor scatter for that matter, 
where the band openings are. Um, it's a kind of convoluted uh, address. It's up there. But do a Google search for VHF propagation maps, and you'll be able to get to this. This is a great tool for those of you who want to do um, any kind of ducting or tropospheric DX work, because it tells you where the band opening is. Uh, those of you who are also into that, Hepburn uh, has a uh, map that does uh, predictions. And it actually matches up pretty well to actual conditions on quite, uh, quite often. Now, what happens when a balloon goes up? It actually creates a band opening. That is, that is just uh, about a half hour apart. That's before the balloon launch. That's, about, that's an hour apart. And that's when a balloon is up around 60,000. That was a 90,000. See, it created that, that balloon was heard in Wisconsin, clear down here into Kentucky. And it shows up on this map as a band opening. And you can actually see the, uh, here's the, uh, the actual uh, balloon tells you how far away it was from the digipeter. Now I'm doing, this is the kind of balloon I'm going to be sending across the Atlantic. The, actually, it's a little bit bigger version of this. Uh, it'll stay up for several days. And there's something called solar balloons. No helium needed. Get a bunch of garbage bags, the thinnest ones possible, tape them together. That is uh, about 10 garbage bags taped together. Take it out in your backyard in the morning on a good hot uh, day where you got a clear, a clear day. Actually, it's a little bit better if it's a little cool out. And the sun will inflate, you know, you basically take a leaf blower or a hair dryer and inflate the thing with air. And the sun, after a while, will take it off the ground. You get a big enough one, this is called a tetrune. It's fairly easy to make. You ever see those coffee creamers that have the kind of an odd shape to it? It's made the exact same way. That's called a tetrun. It's a way of simulating a sphere. And uh, it's the easy way to, easiest way to get the best volume for the bang for the buck. And that's about 10 trash bags taped together. That'll lift two pounds to 60,000 feet and keep it there all day long. But it's a little tricky. Uh, it's tough getting it off the ground. If you get, get it off the ground, you've got a nice long mission. Some of these have gone from, uh, there's a guy in Michigan that does this all the time, uh, KC8UCH, and uh, Robert uh, Rockty is his name. There's his, uh, there's his website. He's at a school called GPA Academy right in downtown Detroit. He launches this as a school project, and uh, I believe it's elementary or junior high. And they spent a couple of days taping these things together with scotch tape. Put a little tracker underneath of it, an APRS tracker or a HF beacon, and they launch it from the school. Some of these have made it all the way to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And uh, he's gotten most of them back, believe it or not. They had one drop in the lake, and somebody found it on their beach house, <laughs> just washed up on shore. But this is a real cheap way of getting something into space if you can, uh, and it's something that kids have a great time putting together. Uh, there's a couple of kids that put notes on them and see how far they go, but they, they can go hundreds of miles. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about long duration floater flights with a latex balloon. I did one with no vent valve, no ballast, I can get 20 hours. The technique is solar radiation accounts for some of the lift in your balloon. If you get it just right and have just the amount of positive lift at launch, which is about eight ounces for a 1,500-gram uh, balloon, that's the size of the balloon they call them. It's actually the weight of the balloon, but that's how they size balloons. And about a pound and a half APRS payload. Uh, if it gets to the altitude you want it to park at, right at the point of sunset, it will lose that lift, which is about eight ounces, and level out. And it'll stay there all night long. I've gotten 1,400 mile flights that lasted over 20 hours this way. And that's what the ascent rate looks like for a long flight like that. They just 
gets up there, about, that's about 102,000 feet, and just levels right out. That's how far it went. Now, the neat thing about this is that is being digipeded out there. That's 350 miles from any dig digipeter station. It was going through Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Cape Cod. 350 miles with a 200 milliwatt uh, microtrack. Um, I was just amazed at that. Of course, we're up about 100,000 feet, but uh, even out there remotely, there's quite a bit of activity in Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, I did not get this one back. <laughs> And then I've got another technique that uh, uses a vent valve and a pinhole. I just put a hole in the balloon through a little PVC pipe, and I put that in the nozzle, 16th inch hole, and that thing floats as well. And it stayed up all night over Tennessee. I tried two holes, went up to 30,000 feet, and came right back down. But the balloon was still inflated. That one had a 30 meter transmitter on it, sending teletype. It landed in a tree in Georgia, and it was too close for 30 meters to me to hear it. So I thought, huh, I'll try one of those internet radios. So I went to Global Tuners, which used to be DX, you know, DX Tuners had a bunch of internet radios you could uh, log on to. So I, the Global Tuners now handles that. So I went to Albany, New York's remote internet radio, and I tuned in 10.142 megahertz, and all of a sudden, I heard a nice, strong S5 teletype signal. And I decoded it. It was my balloon in Georgia transmitting to Albany, New York, and telling me where it was. <laughs> and my friends from Georgia went hiking in through the swamp, and they found it 70 feet up in a tree. And, but they couldn't figure out how to get it out of the tree. So I said, oh, don't worry about it. It wasn't that expensive of a payload. Go back in a year. Maybe it came out of the tree. A year later, our university program flew a flight. It landed 2,000 feet from that balloon, one year apart, almost to the day. So while they were recovering, I says, hey, guys, can you hike back in the woods and see if that thing's out of the tree yet? So they did, and it was laying flat on the ground. <laughs> and I got it back, plugged it in, and it still works. <laughs> uh, we, do, uh, we use this model. This is uh, a government program that they actually used when they were crossing the Atlantic in those round-the-world balloons when they had this uh, competition. Steve Fawcett went on that big trip around the world. He used this program to tell you where a long-duration flight will go at a certain altitude at certain times of the year. So this is how we go from Huntsville, Alabama to Great Britain. Well, it didn't quite make it, but... Uh, the University of Tennessee group got within 300 miles of Ireland during their attempt last year. Well, it was about two years ago. And it tells you what altitudes you need to be at. March is a great time to fly, but you end up in Morocco. But it only takes about 36 hours to fly clean across the Atlantic during the winter. During the summer is a different story. I can launch a balloon from Huntsville, Alabama and have it go to Tucson in two days. Now, can you imagine a uh, digipeter or a voice a linear transponder like an Eris sat kind of thing? Steve, wink, wink. <laughs> Intent. I could cover the entire country on a two-day flight, and everybody just, it's like a, uh, an AMSAT satellite that's going really, really slow. And in October... It can go anywhere depending on your altitude. You can actually steer it up and down with ballast and a vent and keep it right overhead by zipping back and forth over different altitude vectors. And November is when the season starts for uh, transatlantic flights. So from November to about the end of March. I'm going to start doing my program probably in December. Uh, we've been flying for 22 years. And every year, we hold a Great Plains Super Launch. Ten balloons usually show up. It's usually in a Plains state, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, uh, sometimes Colorado. This next year, it will be held in Hutchinson's, Kansas. Uh, if you go to superlaunch.org, uh, we'll have the information for next year's. It's usually in July. 
And it's a conference just like this. We usually have about 50 or 60 attendees, anybody who's into doing their, their own balloon or wanting to learn more about it. And we have a conference one day, and the next day we uh, do a, a huge 10 balloon at once kind of launch. And it's great fun because you're out there tracking 10 balloons at once on, on APRS, and you're trying to decide which one I'm going to go after first. And we rained down across this little little town in Kansas uh, last uh, July, and those people just didn't know what was going on because there's balloons falling everywhere, parachutes falling everywhere around their little town. But we have a blast, and uh, you're all welcome to come out and, uh, and join one of those conferences. Uh, all are invited. Uh, the next uh, video we'll do is from the, that's the big rocket being launched from the deck of the boat 200 miles out in the Gulf. Now we were a bit worried that's a 400 pound uh, payload and it was directly over the boat and we got to thinking what happens if that broke free and fell through the boat? What do we do? <laughs> yes. Now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, the next video is the balloons, the launch platform's perspective of the actual ignition of the rocket. Now, our goal was to launch, to cut the balloon, deflate the balloon, then launch the rocket straight up. Unfortunately, our device to cut the balloon and deflate it did not work. So I said, why not just launch the balloon right, the rocket right through the balloon? So we tried to do that, but we missed. <laughs> I don't know how we missed, but we did. So the next video you see is the rocket blasting out of the launch gondola. Uh, we're doing this on 2.4 gigahertz. You see the overlay of the uh, latitude. There goes the rocket. See the rocket going? We're uh, over 60,000 feet here, about 30 miles from the balloon. So that's a three-foot dish, 2.4 gigahertz, one watt FM television. And we're running it to a, a little wheel antenna, which is about only that big, it's a little cloverleaf. Uh, let's try and run that one more time, and you'll see, we'll show you the rocket uh, zipping out of the gondola again. There we go. We used a touch tone command to ignite it. There it goes. And see, we somehow just went right around the balloon. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we had a little flaw in the rocket. The uh, motor fell off at ignition. That was the pressure tank from the nitrous that sent it off past the balloon. We went horizontally and then spent a nine-minute spiraling freefall into the Gulf of Mexico, which I would show you, but you're all not a good thing to show after dinner. <laughs> there it goes again. It looks kind of like a Saturn V, doesn't it? That balloon stayed up there all night long. <laughs> Did it finally break down? Break or? It came down uh, in the middle of the night, about 3 in the morning. Splashed down in a bombing test area at, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico where they do their bombing runs. I figured that was appropriate. Now they have a target. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you a YouTube of a... Uh, how many of you ever seen the Flip video? It's a little pocket camcorder. It's called the Flip Ultra. Anybody seen one of those? It's a little pocket camera, about yay big. It costs about $129. And it can record two hours of very high quality video with stereo sound. I decided to put this in June on one of the launches we're doing. There's a a new spaceport in Indiana going up in Columbus, Indiana. It's at the Bacalar Airport just north of town. And they've got a building and uh, their goal is to do uh, balloon flights and rocket launches for uh, students and also do uh, research for industry and uh, universities. And uh, this is where they've been holding uh, Indiana Space Camp uh, for the past two years. And uh, I'm going to show you a flight that was done pointing up at the balloon as we uh, were from about 
20, 20 feet below the balloon. This is at 95,000 feet. The balloon is 33 feet in diameter, and this has sound to it, too, so we'll crank the sound up on it. That the experiments, those are two potato chip bags, and the astronauts are right above that. We were hoping to see if the potato chip bags would blow up in the vacuum, but they didn't. That made me jump. <laughs> Sounds like a shotgun blast, doesn't it? Now notice the parachute opens almost immediately, and this is a near vacuum. Here's a still frame slow-mo. Instead, right? That's right. <laughs> Fill them with helium and away we go. We're falling at several hundred miles an hour. Now the potato chick bags fell off at 45,000 feet. Now somebody was just walking around when two bags of potato chips fell out of the sky. <laughs> it was their lucky day. <laughs> uh, well, we've had quite a few adventures and we're going to do quite a few more. Um, and it teaches the students how to go through and run, a, run their own space program. Uh, they also teach them checklists. We did one flight before we did checklists. Um, it was a very complicated experiments. Lots of switches had to be turned on before they launched it. And it's a thousand feet in the air, beautiful liftoff. Everything was going great. And I heard one student say to the other, did you turn it on? I thought you did. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. We got it back because we had a backup APRS beacon on it. But uh, they learned, they had a nice uh, page about proper checklist procedure on the report. <laughs> we flew it for them the next day. So, any questions? Yeah, I, uh, the first video you showed, um, I know I, when I saw it, I realized I've seen this at a club meeting in Long Island. No kidding. You, wow. I assume you've yeah, we, in I sent Long tapes Island. out all over the, uh, okay. people, people asked for tapes on it, and that was part of it. <laughs> yeah, okay, because I, because I didn't think you were at the club meeting either. Uh, no. Thank, thank you. Hi, you mentioned uh, a couple times dropping ballast. Yes. What was the mechanism used to drop ballast? Got a little uh, servo motor that opens, actually has a little hose that comes out of a, bo a bottle of alcohol, of ethanol, pure ethanol. And uh, I'm going to drop that hose out and let it leak out, and then the servo has a little eye bolt that flips that tube back up. But you're basically dropping out uh, drops of uh, ethanol. And that, of course, doesn't it evaporates, so it's not a hazard to the ground. And there's been various uh, different varieties of how to do that process. But uh, that's one fairly lightweight, uh, and ethanol won't freeze at those temperatures. Now, you have to be careful if you use antifreeze, because some antifreeze won't make it all the way down, so you have to get the right antifreeze. And we went, opted for ethanol because it was a little bit more environmentally friendly than antifreeze would be. In one word, insurance. Oh, that, that's always a sticky thing, but uh, you can insure a balloon flight. Um, the odds, really, of hitting anything are pretty low. Um, they've launched hundreds of thousands of weather balloons since the 30s, or even before, for the Weather Bureau. They launched two balloons a day at 72 sites in the United States of this size of balloon, of the, the weather balloon type. And they have never hit a plane. Now, I will preface that with, on one of my flight, early flights, I had a chase plane. And it had a TV camera in it, live TV transmitter. And at burst, the antenna broke off. Now, the airplane had a TV set inside 
the airplane, and he was watching the video from the balloon. He uh, had a pilot, and the chase guy was riding co-pilot watching the uh, TV screen. And we lost video on the ground station because the antenna's gone. Well, I told the chase plane about where it was going to land, so he circled that area to see if he could see anything. All of a sudden, he says, hey, I'm getting video. It's getting stronger. I got a great picture. And I says, you must be crazy. There's nothing here at our ground station. We were 30 miles away. We had nothing. But he's getting a good picture. And he says, yeah, I see houses. I see a lake. Hey, those are the same houses and lake that we're over. I see an airplane wing. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> So I almost wiped out our first chase plane. But <laughs> and it went whipping, right as he said that, he said it went right off his wingtip. <laughs> but we had a chase helicopter at the same time, and he swooped in and got it out of the desert. It landed, it, it came down without a parachute, because the parachute ripped to shreds. This is like the second or third flight I'd ever done, and I used a paper parachute, and it just shredded it. Uh, so I use ripstop nylon now, but uh, it crashed down the desert floor, probably going close to 100 miles an hour, but it landed in a sand dune, and it was unharmed. A little bent up, but not too bad. But the helicopter just swooped right in and grabbed it up. <laughs> but it does help to have a chase plane, but don't get them too close to where it's coming down. Fortunately, with APRS, you now have a pretty good indication of where it is and where the plane is. Any other questions? I noticed you actually had uh, a combination of antennas. You mentioned uh, vertical antennas, but a couple of those had little, well, big wheels, little big wheels on right. the bottom of them, looked like UHF. Mm -hmm. Was there some purpose for those? They better to, easier to aim, better Yeah, aim so the, uh, the little wheel, uh, we actually use uh, ones designed by Dave Klingerman, W6OAL, uh, and he's got a company called Old Antenna Labs. They're very lightweight. They're basically mount, uh, soldered right to the end connector or the BNC connector. And so you get a very lightweight but very high quality antenna. They, it's an omnidirectional horizontal antenna. And the nice thing about that style of antenna, it's three wave, you know, four wave loops and a clover leaf. And uh, you get a nice hemispherical pattern underneath of it. It's kind of circular underneath, but there's very little fading. Whereas with a vertical whip, you get a big null zone directly off the end of the whip. And so if you're directly underneath the payload, and in fact, at altitude, if you're uh, 10 miles either side from directly underneath, on a vertical antenna, you're not going to get much of any, of any kind of signal. It could be 10 or 20 dB null. So the, that particular antenna, we use it mostly for uh, ATV or something that requires a lot of signal so that we don't, we fill in that zone so there's no nulls underneath. I imagine you wouldn't do this with young kids, but have you ever experimented using uh, hydrogen instead of helium? Oh, I thought you were going to say sending young kids into space. Well, no. we need a spacesuit, no. an oxygen tank, and a parachute, no. But, no. <laughs> and a chair. No, I'm, I'm just thinking keeping the cost down. Um, and, and yes, uh, hydrogen is actually fairly safe to use and quite a bit cheaper than helium. Helium has been skyrocketing in pl price lately. That, the tank of helium I generally use for a bigger balloon system that carries 12 pounds is about 300 cubic foot. It's called a um, 291 cubic foot tank. Uh, and that used to cost me about 50 bucks. Now it costs 120. Um, hydrogen is about half the cost. And in fact, some places you can get it for 30 or $40 for the same amount. But you have to be careful. Um, there's certain things you have to do. You have to have a special regulator. What, you don't want to have the flow as fast as what you would do for uh, helium. And take some precaution for static, particularly if you're in a desert environment, it might be a little risky. And make sure no one's smoking or scuffing their feet on the carpet and touching it. <laughs> Just avoid uh, static spark and smoking and you should be okay with the hydrogen. But I would actually first time start out with helium, get experience, and then, uh, then go to hydrogen uh, at a later time. But the last couple of GPSL conferences, we've had about a 50-50 mix of hydrogen, helium uh, balloons. Any plans to try nitrogen? Nitrogen doesn't have much lift at all. Uh, there are uh, 
You could actually use a few other gases. Ammonia actually would work, but it doesn't have near the lift that hydrogen or helium is. Yes? How do you get your funding for these experiments? Well, right here. <laughs> now, big pockets. Um, different ways. Um, a lot of us individually chip in with components for a balloon. Uh, we form a group and uh, we basically chip in the cost for all that's required. As long as you're recovering your payloads, you can reuse them. That's a fixed cost, one-time cost. You do have to plan on the eventuality that you might lose one. Um, so, uh, but I've written a program that tells where the balloons are gonna go based on your ascent rate and your parachute size using winds aloft forecasts, and it's fairly accurate. There's a website on nearspaceventures.com where you can plug in that data online and it'll plot your flight profile on a Google map and it'll tell you about where you're gonna land and you can do that about three days in advance uh, fairly accurately. So if it looks like it's gonna end up in a swamp, a military base, an airport, or the ocean, you might wanna think twice about sending up your $1,000 worth of equipment. And you don't have to send up $1,000 worth of equipment, you can send up uh, you know, a $50 little payload if you want with a little tracking beacon as a fox hunt. It's the ultimate fox hunt. Um, but you can, you can do things to reduce the odds of losing your payload and make sure that your team is also experienced to do a fox hunt or two before you fly because you might have to just rely on a tracking beacon to find it if you can't get an APRS signal. Um, but that being said, that we basically spread the cost out amongst us the expendables are the balloon and the helium or, and or hydrogen, uh, and that generally will cost you about $200 per launch for the balloon and the gas, and that's, that's your expendable cost. Plus, if you're using primary lithium batteries, there's a cost involved there, but you can use the rechargeable batteries too. Yeah, hi, Bill. This is more of a comment than uh, a question, but about a month ago on, I think it was the History Channel, they did a documentary on uh, um, a rather extensive balloon attack on uh, the Pacific Northwest of the United States during World War II from uh, our opponents over on the other side of the Pacific. And it was, it was really fascinating to look at the, the effort they went to with the paper balloons and the fuses to control the ballast and everything that they did to uh, get that. And I don't know if maybe you're aware of it uh, in the documentary. Maybe there's some other place you could see it besides waiting for it to come around on, I guess it was the History uh, Channel. Smith, the Smithsonian has an article on it that's really quite uh, detailed. and uh, Smithsonian Magazine? Yeah, okay. and it's great because the Japanese attacked America successfully and no one knew about it. It was the, <laughs> it was the biggest case of voluntary censorship by our media ever because the Japanese pummeled us with hundreds of balloon bombs. And it was a huge program. They launched 9,000 balloons. They had people building balloon materials out of mulberry paper and rubber. In, they were sewing these, people were sewing these in their homes. And they go out and they had these massive balloons with ballast. They had big sandbags that would drop out when it came down below a certain altitude. They parked it in the jet stream and they had a 33 pound uh, incendiary bomb. The idea was they were going to start massive forest fires across America and cause a panic. And 240 of these are known to have made it to America. Some as far east as Michigan. A Michigan farmer in the 80s found one while plow plowing his field and the bomb was still active. And uh, the first time that anybody noticed one of these was in Oregon when a teacher and some school kids found one, moved it, exploded and it killed them all, and that was never printed in the press. They squashed that story immediately. No one knew about it until years later. And so the Japanese gave up. They said, well, they aren't making it because there's no reports of mass panic and because of this voluntary censorship by our US papers and uh, news media, they gave up on the program because their next step was to send biological warfare. But they gave up on the program because apparently it wasn't working, but they were massively successful. So I, I'm not gonna send a balloon bomb to uh, Europe. Uh, <laughs> don't have to worry about that.
kind of testing do you do? You do any testing prior? Yes. Because I'm ensuring that the, I'm not sure if the atmospheric, absolute um, atmospheric temperature, I mean atmospheric pressure might affect some of the components like your cameras and microphones. I and generally like do cold testing on things. Uh, I don't do vacuum testing, although there are some members that do a full-up vacuum uh, chamber. Uh, a guy named Paul Verhage, KD4STH, has built a vacuum test chamber that also um, does cold testing as well. Uh, but generally, you can make a cold uh, chamber out of a cooler with a couple of fans and some dry ice, and you can get down to about 60 below zero, and it's a great way of testing that kind of stuff. Because things like servo motors, sometimes the grease that they use in the gears will freeze up at that temperature, and you won't get a servo to move. So it's things like that you, you need to know before you uh, do a launch. So you, you keep these, you, in your talk earlier, you said you were keeping some of these components warm by enclosing them in... Yeah, we, we usually enclose them in a styrofoam container. And uh, one thing I've been doing, though, is uh, typically it's like one or two inches of, uh, of styrofoam. And uh, essentially they're, they're like beer coolers or these fishing bait tackle boxes. You, I mean, I've seen people use those for payload uh, housings. And that um, insulation, if you're generating some heat inside, will keep it above freezing usually. But if you're not generating a lot of heat by your electronics, you could go down to 20, 30, or 40 below zero. You'll still stay above the outside in temperature a little bit. And you've got to also calculate in the solar effect. If you paint your payload black, uh, solar radiation is going to help. In fact, I'm doing a really minimalist payload because I'm constrained to 12 ounces as a hitchhiker on those ozone balloons. I now tape up my experiments with black tape, put two layers of bubble wrap around it, and it acts like a greenhouse effect, and it keeps it above freezing. And it's very lightweight. I figured if it w works for sending things through UPS, bubble wrap, it ought to work for a balloon payload. <laughs> and, it, I, and I've had payloads that are just a few ounces that way, that which normally would have been a lot heavier. But that'll only work during the daytime. I flew one of those, and it was above freezing during the day, but at night it went down to 40 below zero. I, I just had one other question. Was, was how do you deploy the parachute? Oh, it's, it's in line. So when the balloon pops, the parachute just pops open. The, as it's falling, the air comes, swoops in, and opens it up. That's why the embroidery hoop is down below to keep the lines from tangling up below the pa parachute. And uh, the cold testing is also important for battery life because if you fly alkaline batteries, you'll find that they will freeze out unless you keep it warm inside. So lithium batteries are the batteries of choice but you still lose about half their capacity if it gets down below freezing. So you have to know those things if you're planning for a certain life. Okay, I think that we'll call it an evening. Thank you very much, Bill.